Um, this is not going to be like a, a typical talk in that uh, I'm not, I have been a researcher in this field in the past, but that's not what I do anymore. And most of what I get asked to do is kind of reflect on the field and its evolution and what we can kind of anticipate up about the future based in part on what has happened to date. And one of the things I find, you know, I spent a lot of time, uh, I guess I could show you on this next slide, I've got teaching roles in three different informatics programs. Uh, and, I, and I find in talking to students that their, their knowledge of the field kind of starts when they got into the field. And they don't have a, a necessarily a long perspective on how, how all this happened. And, and even how long it's been going on, which, which is often, I think, underappreciated especially by docs who uh, out there in the world that are now dealing with EHRs. I think EHRs just kind of fell from heaven or came up from hell <laughs> in the last, uh, you know, the last decade. But there's a long history there. So I, I thought I would try to put that all in, in some perspective, <coughs> help you to understand why things seem to have taken off a lot recently. Uh, this room is filled with more people than would have called themselves informaticians in 1970, for sure. We didn't even have the word in 1970, in fact. Uh, but there weren't that many people working in the, on these kinds of problems uh, or anticipating that this was a direction worth working on. And it, it struck me the other day, I, I don't know if any of you saw this 60 Minutes just in April, a couple of months ago, and they did a big bit on the Media Lab at MIT. Uh, and in that show, I highlighted it down here in the lower left, uh, Medro Ponte predicted the rise of flat panel displays, 8D TVs, and news whenever you wanted, starting in the 1980s. He saw the future, was kind of this notion. He had been working on things that today we take for granted. And I realized that's just about true of every scientific field. He's particularly been good at marketing what they've done at the Media Lab. It's got quite a reputation for being quite futuristic. But the reality is most science is based on anticipating, predicting, and building things that will become the future. And it's certainly true in this field as well. Uh, so that's one of my, my points today. I want to talk about how the field has interacted with the evolution of technology, which has been rampant and remarkable over the last 50 years. Um, that provides us with a context for thinking about what's happened with EHRs and the way they've evolved. Then we can think in that context about informatics as a discipline that began, began to get recognized as its own field. Um, the recent emergence of precision medicine, big data, data analytics, and the like. Uh, how the CTSA program in translational science have had a huge impact on the growth of this field made us think differently about EHRs even. And then how all that might help us think a little bit about where we're headed. Okay. So that's that's a lot, but I will try to do a high level version of that. I don't know. Okay. Now you've all heard old timers tell stories about taking boxes full of Hallerith cards, punch cards to a large mainframe computer somewhere across campus when they were in college, and tripping and dropping their entire box of cards and having to sort it manually or what have you. That is what computing was when I first got into this field too. Um, but I'm not going to talk about all of the cards. But I am going to start just shortly after that. Because in the 60s, we saw this evolution from great big mainframe computers and batch processing, where you literally had to get a batch of your, take your program and have it run maybe in three or four hours and we'd go back late that night to get the output, which would come out on some line printer. And nine times out of 10, it would tell you about some error you made with a comma on the cards and the thing would run and you'd have to go back and fix that card and rerun it. And it could take forever to get a, a program to actually run if you weren't really careful as you were using key punch, key punch machines to make your, your cards. But then, in the, in the 60s largely, we saw the introduction of much smaller computers 
that you could actually use through interactive terminal devices. Okay? And in fact, the first one I ever used looked like that. If it looks to you like an old uh, uh, telegram machine, like for set, maybe you never even saw those, but they, we used to have those in the telegraph offices if you wanted to send a telegram. But they also could be used to connect to these mini computers that we started to use in the 60s. And they had scrolling papers, they had all ASCII characters, all uppercase, it was a very low, uh, uh, limited character set. But it's amazing how much we got done. So when I first started working on medical computing, this is what I used for my first programming projects. It was at Mass General Hospital in Boston. I was an undergrad at Harvard in those days. I'm not talking, I hate to say it, 68, 69, 70, something like that. So we're talking more than 50 years ago, which dates me. <laughs> By the end of that decade, though, we were beginning to see the introduction of paper-saving devices. You see, you no longer had scrolling paper coming out, but we actually used these kinds of uh, terminals, uh, the CRT screens, usually still only uppercase character sets for doing our programming and getting our uh, feedback in real time. We weren't doing batch processing anymore, right? Real-time processing. Now, think for a minute. Now, how could you ever even think about doing an EHR in a day when that was your computing interface? And I'll come to that in a second. Okay. We did see the first efforts to develop pointing devices. The mouse was still being created in a research lab at SRI International. Park, California, by Doug Engelbart. But we had light pens, and light pens were these devices that actually the wire coming out the back fed into the back of the device. This was not, these were not computers, these were all terminals for interacting with computers. Right? We didn't have any computers, so yeah. Uh, but you could sense where you were pointing on the screen in this way, you could select rather than have to type, and everybody kind of knew that was something that doctors would care about and that we should be working with such devices. Well, I was a pre-med student. I knew I was going to go into medicine. I discovered computers, began to think, gee, maybe I could combine these two in some way. Uh, that's why I went to work at Mass General, to see a place that was actually trying to do that. Uh, but we all shared what was totally intuitive recognition that that can't be the way to manage patient care data. This is 1968, 69, a long time ago. And much of it was focused on the direct encounter with patients. So for example, when we saw these huge charts that many patients had, and we knew that what we wanted was somewhere there, the thought of sitting and going through all those charts or all that paper was pretty off-putting, but that's what you had to do. And those of us beginning to get interested in data management methods quickly figured out, now wait a minute, if all this were in computers, you could find that piece of information essentially immediately by switching appropriately for it. Did this patient have his pneumovex? Pretty terrible question to ask uh, if you have a, a huge paper chart. So I got working on a project with a guy some of you have heard of. His name is Bob Greenis. He was a PhD student in, uh, at Harvard in the, in the uh, engineering school. And he had finished medicine and was now doing a PhD in computer science, and everybody thought he was crazy, but I thought it was a great idea to do the bump, to do the bump. Bob Greenis, who knows Bob Greenis? Still very active in the field. A name you should know, okay? He's a professor uh, at uh, Arizona State University right now. He was at Harvard for many years, okay? So he and I and other, I was his programming assistant, research assistant, and we got interested in developing an electronic health record that could be used to manage the hypertension clinic uh, at Mass General. Um, eventually, that got written up in a, in a paper that appeared in the New England Journal in 1970. Okay. So the New England Journal actually published a paper on EHRs in 1970. <laughs> Recording, retrieval, and review of medical data by physician computer interaction. They call it electronic health record, but clearly it was. If you look at that, at that display, however, you'll see that it was somewhat unusual. In fact, it was a one-of-a-kind display that we actually worked with Raytheon. You see that's a Raytheon label on the, on the uh, uh, terminal. Um, 
the idea was we want people to be able to use their finger to point at the screen, not one of these light pens. These are for doctors. We want them just to be able to point at, at, at what they are selecting. So we got them to embed in the screen of one of these um, CRTs little aluminum wires. Can you see that there, uh, there are rows of aluminum wires down that screen? And they all go off to the left and feed into a little bit of electronics. And you would change the capacitance if you touched the wire, and it would sense which wire you could touch, and therefore what you had selected on the screen, and if it knew what it was displaying on the screen, it knew what you cho were choosing. Okay. The whole, there were ways you could type in stuff if you wanted, but most of it was done by allowing people to select things with their fingers on the screen. This is imagining the future. This was my first citation in the literature <laughs> when they listed people that had helped on the project. And I, I remember thinking, well, that's, the, that's like the biggest thing that's ever happened to me. You know, <laughs> being cited in the big journal. So, you, know, you know, when you're an undergraduate student, you actually have that a lot. Within 20 years, 25 years, we didn't need, you know, then we did have standalone computers, microprocessors, mice for controlling the interaction, and we didn't need to use touch screens anymore, although of course those have come back in different versions. If you look at that screen carefully, you'll see it has both upper and lower case, and it has grayscale. It's not all just white on black, the way the old terminals were. So it, the, the, the technology was evolving uh, during that time, and EHRs began to reflect that. So what happened during the 1980s? Well. That was the big revolution. That's the introduction of microprocessors. And so you might think that the IBM PC was the first of these, a standalone computer. Of course, it really followed the, the Apple II uh, that had come out from the early Apple company in uh, the late 70s. Uh, but IBM, to their credit, figured out this is something they couldn't ignore, and they came up with their own version. And, you all know the story about them needing an operating system and finding a guy named Bill Gates to write it for him. And the rest is history. Uh, that's not the first Macintosh. That's actually earlier than the first Macintosh. This was their first version that tried to capture the graphical interface, which was not part of the PC. The PC was still ASCII characters. And this was called the, the Apple Lisa. It came out in the early 1980s. Uh, we used it. Get, get some of them for our lab at Stanford, but they weren't really released as a commercial product, and were, when they were ready to, to release them, that's when the Macintosh came out in its very first form, okay, in about 1982, 182. But you notice it had a mouse, and it had a graphical interface of the sort that Xerox Corporation had been developing during the 1970s at Xerox Park, the Palo Alto Research Center. It didn't hurt that I was at Stanford for, during this period. I, I went to med school at Stanford and got quickly involved with the computer science community there and ended up doing my joint degree there. Uh, not, at, not at Harvard, but while I was at med school. These are what these uh, Xerox machines look like. And for a while, we thought they were going to change the world. Look at the graphical interface on that. Um, and this was roughly 82, 83 again. These were sold as standalone workstations, quite expensive. They were used mostly for research. And uh, the operating system for these was LISP. So they were called LISP machines, and they were used largely for AI applications, because LISP had become the language for artificial intelligence by that time. And research so uh, I had finished my dissertation by this time. I did it all on terminals and a lot, but my first project as a faculty member was to use these list machines and their graphical capabilities to produce uh, an integrated medical record with a, with a decision support system. And I won't go into detail with the system that we call Moccasin, which was designed to assist physicians in, in uh, caring for patients in role uh, in chemotherapy trials with cancer. Uh, it just duplicated on the screen their usual record keeping flowcharts. These were data sheets. You notice every column is a different date. Every time they would come to the outpatient clinic, they'd fill in 
their current status and based on their current status you would make a decision about how to treat them relative to the protocol and Anderson's job was to actually do that filling in for you you could override it but it would it knew the rules of the protocol it knew what data you would enter on the floor sheet and it would help you figure out what the right dosing would be for your patient Now, as you can tell, even from the few examples I've given you, research precedes the actual commercial implementation of systems. It takes a while for these ideas to percolate out into the commercial world. So if this system that I, sh uh, that I showed you earlier was the, what was commercially available in the early 1990s, what were we doing in our research lab around the same time? Well, again with Apple, we got a hold of the first tablet computer that never was actually sold. It was called the Newton, the Apple Newton. Some of you might have heard of that. But it was a handheld pen-based interface with a graphical interface on it. And one of our grad students did his dissertation trying to think about how would you do a medical record on one of these devices. Uh, and he did. It was called Pen Ivory. <coughs> it was on the Apple Newton. And briefly, uh, you'll notice that the person's entering a history on the, on the left as they're going through the history taking process and you circle the things that are true for your patient. Whichever thing you circled most recently is in a bold circle. So you see cough is the most recent uh, thing that was circled and all the modifiers on the right are the modifiers for cough. So you would then circle the modifiers you wanted to enter to describe the cough. And if you look at the top on the right hand side, you'll see that it generated a text note as you were circling these things. So the idea was, would there be a way using controlled vocabulary and controlled interface to, not, to actually still produce the kind of notes that people want to be able to read uh, using this kind of an interactive process? Alex Prune went on to be, I think, employee number four for a little company called eBay. And he drives a real nice car right now. <laughs> <laughs> so some of these guys in our training program went on to do non-medical things, but most, most have stayed in biomedical computing. See, this, this book had a big impact. It came out at almost exactly the same time, the early 1990s. Uh, it, was, it was actually one of the few IOM reports to ever get re-released in, in an updated version later in the 1990s, in 1997. Uh, but it was a committee that was brought together by the IOM to study the issue of the medical record and what was wrong with it and what could be done to improve it. And within the first hour of the first meeting of that study group, uh, they decided we're not even going to talk about paper records. The future is clearly in electronic records. And the whole report was about computerizing uh, the medical record. Now, just in anticipation of the next century, how much of the discussion in that report or in any of the work I've described today do you think dealt with charge capture? Nobody has an opinion. I mean, it's zero, right? That was never what it was about. It was all about clinical care and improving the care of patients and improving our access to the data we needed to care for patients. So in the world of research, EHRs were about patient care. You need to bear that in mind as you interpret what subsequently happened to the products. The products became prettier and prettier. Epic had been started in 1979 only doing outpatient charts. And by the 90s, they had these kinds of interfaces. Um, uh, if you look at the top, it says the birth date of this patient was 1936 and his age is 63. So this is a 1999 screen of, of, of Epic. Uh, Epic Health Center across the top. So I'm having to reconstruct this from some very old slides, but this was about 1999. Cerner had been around, they focused more on the inpatient side. The big change in the truth in the early, in the next, in the next decade was when Epic decided to generalize and go inpatient as well as outpatient. Uh, 
it's paid off for the founder of Epic, who continues to own Epic. It's never gone public. And she's pretty amazing in many ways. But I don't think she really has a lot of respect for the community on which she has been drawn. So there's, there's a real interface issue between this epic system, which is about to be installed here, or being installed here, and the view of the company about biomedical informatics as a discipline on which they're dependent, or with which they should be working. Now, Sam and I had a little conversation about this yesterday, and maybe some, a few counterexamples here and there. But compared to the way an IBM or a Facebook or a Google has been interacting with the computer science community, there is no comparison. Now I'd like to see much more R&D and interaction with our community by these major companies. They have a lot to give up for us. It wasn't just those two. Here was a, a system called Medical Logic, which then went on to become GE Office Centricity. It was acquired. I see GE just spun up their whole health computing business recently too. So. It has a long history and it's moved along. It's probably the existing moment for a while. Medical Logic was a, a, a major player. And then those of us who've been doing this for a while had our jaws, jaws drop in, 19, in 2004 when in the State of the Union address, George Bush made this statement. He wants universal implementation of electronic health records within 10 years. That would have been 2014. Didn't quite make it by 2014. But a lot did happen in this front, right? Between over that next decade. I think that Bush didn't have a lot of insight into what he was calling for here. You know, people feeding lines for his speech, just like all presidents get their material from lots of places. Um, I do think he wanted to kind of try to match JFK's call for putting a man on the moon in 10 years. I'm not sure he realized that it was actually harder to have EHRs for every American in 10 years than it was to put a man on the moon in 10 years. So the visible interest in moving from the bottom to the top of this diagram, digitizing electronic health records, really kind of, that's a kind of turning point. That's also when ONC was started in May of 2004. Some of us have been calling for something like ONC for 15, 20 years, saying the government has got to take a, a leadership role in coordinating all these activities that are going on between industry and academia and the like. Uh, but ONC finally was created largely through efforts of <coughs> then Secretary of HHS, Tommy Thompson, uh, who uh, kind of unrolled out ONC with uh, much fanfare that time. And uh, you know, the EHR today has gone through so much evolution. They look pretty, and uh, you know, there are tablet versions uh, uh, and, and the like. So uh, the EHR has continuously changed in response to the evolution in the technology itself and the kind of computers that we have. Uh, and it has stayed in the forefront of politics as well. And, you know, during the election in 2008, I took this off, off of Obama's website. And he was he was definitely in favor of Bush's effort to promote electronic health records and held out tea. And you'll recall that as soon as he took over, you know, the economy started to crash on, on all of us. And there was a big stimulus bill to try to get the economy back on track. A very large amount of money in the stimulus package was put into electronic health records. Something like $22 billion. Ended up being more than that, subsequently. Most of it went to CMS so that they could pay incentives to doctors and hospitals to implement EHRs. And about two billion of it went to ONC. So in 2007, ONC's budget was about 60 million dollars for everything they did. And the next year, their budget was two billion dollars. 
just imagine that kind of transition for an organization. That's when uh, David Blumenthal was called down from the Harvard School of Public Health and Harvard Medical School to become the head of ONC. He had been a big promoter of Obama and worked with him on his campaign. And he, he had to handle this $2 billion infusion of funds. And this diagram is simply to show you what the High Tech Act did to the job market in HIT. I think I can't see my own slides from over there. Yeah, you can see them. So this is this is HIT job market after this vertical line is is the uh, stimulus bill. Okay. 2000, early 2009, right? He was elected in 2008. And this is the uh, recovery of the job market in healthcare and all all jobs. And this is the job market uh, percentage increase basis for HIT. So suddenly there was this huge need in order to implement all these systems that people were being incentivized to implement for people to do it. And there were special grant programs. This department got some grants to do some of that. It was good training people in applied health information technology. Unfortunately, not everybody got as well trained as the ones in this department. So there's a lot of folks that really didn't have very good training or understanding of the field who were out there trying to learn systems. And today, this is last year, about a year ago, physicians say EHRs are net negative for patients. And if you look in more detail, the benefits that EHR systems provide patients in the form of easy access to information comes at a cost to the doctor-patient relationship. And according to a new study, and it also says physicians, uh, the administrative burden on physicians associated with EHRs has received attention as a factor in physician burden. And anybody who looks at the EHRs and the way they're being used today has to sympathize with that perspective. So what's aggravating the problem? The systems that people are being asked to use are largely optimized for finance and dilemma as a priority. That's who buys the systems, the folks who run the business operations of large health systems. Clinical care is pretty much secondary. And as this department knows and tries to fight all the time, research uses of data has tended to come third. on here is, is one of those places that is trying to fight that third point, figure out how to make the research uses of data, uh, if not above third, then much more easy to accomplish if the first two are accomplished. I think that most of you who have used the HRs would agree that there's something about them that shows that they haven't really been thinking about usability and workflow or about the potential impact on the interaction with the patient. Common complaints. Uh, especially from physicians, and maybe less so from the patients themselves, although some of that complain about it, the docs only looking at the computer screen. And there's this sense that the decisions about all this is too often dominated by administrators rather than users and that within the companies the decisions are largely being optimized based upon what's good for the business given who their customers are well I think all, all, all hope is not lost um, and I want to draw a kind of analogy which because I think these are largely bumps on the road but they're major ones and they have to be dealt with I'm going to use commercial aviation as a little example of this. So we all remember learning about kitty pot cramp device by Bill and others. And that was around 1900. By 1930, commercial aviation had really taken off. You get on planes and fly coast to coast. You notice they have propellers. I don't know if they had anticipated jet engines yet. But there was a business there. People got on and used them. They, they met a need. And of course, you know, today our most modern airplanes 
might have been sort of anticipated, but not in detail in 1930. They didn't know exactly where all that was going to head. Now, let's not pretend that 787 is the end of the road, either. I mean, you've probably read recently about electric engines for airplanes, for example, and the changes that are coming in, in aviation, problems with fuel consumption and carbon footprints and the like. So I think we can assume that aviation is that we take so much for granted is likely to change a lot going forward as well. So in the case of EHRs, let's face it, commercial aviation in 1930 was a whole lot better than what they had in Cape Cod. Right? But it wasn't a 787. And I would argue that, you know, what we have is a lot better than Kitty Hawk. A lot better than what I worked on in 1968 against General Hawk. <coughs> Well, he charts to get better than they are. And we're on, a, we're on a bit of a journey here. This is often what happens uh, when technologies get invented and begin to evolve and emerge in new ways. So, I want to think a little bit about what we've already seen in medical practice. I mean, I don't see too many great haired people here, but those of us with gray hair certainly remember the days of films like that. You do. Former radiologist, of course you remember. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, and you put them up on screens and you order them properly and you huddle around them on rounds. And it was part of the culture of going on rounds to go to see x for your patients. Well, this began to change as we saw more and more computed radiography and new ways of displaying it, and new ways of sharing it, and new ways of sending it around the institution and not having to try to find a boat of old films in front of a patient because they were all stored electronically now. Right? So we saw really positive changes occur in radiology associated with its automation may have gotten more expensive, but it certainly addressed a lot of the problems that we can remember from the days when it was all on Mylar, or whatever that stuff was that they held up, films. And those films were not easy to convince radiologists that they didn't need. The, 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 the conversion to computed to, uh, radiography, which is now essentially complete, went through a rocky period there. Where people said, oh, I gotta hold that in my hand. I gotta hold it up and do backlighting with a, with a display bulb, and, and, and I can't read it in the same way. And what did they do? They did studies. They did studies that showed you could be better with computer tomography than if you learned how to use it than you ever were in, uh, in the old film days. And our community demands that. And they're demanding that with EHRs, too, right? Prove it. We're now in this new world of uh, visualization capabilities, this changing radiography and visualization of, of, of medical data all the time. So what, what lies ahead? Well, it's really here. We just have to see more of it. That, that picture, I don't know if you can tell, but that looks familiar. Everybody's been in a private doc's office or a uh, primary care office where that's hanging on the wall. But this one is, totally connected in wireless ways so that every image that you see by looking in here is captured. It's the Internet of Things, basically, right? Just another Internet of Things device, like your uh, automated thermostat that Alexa turns on for you at home. And we're seeing all these new ways of interacting with data, and also maybe the days of passwords are, are, are really going to be gone soon see much more of this kind of biometric identification. So now how do we put this in the context of the underlying discipline that's been evolving along with all this? And that is what many of you are here learning about, is just informatics itself. Um, and most of us would argue this is the academic and research base for the progress that we can see in this field. And you would hope that it would therefore be attractive to the companies that are commercializing and the ideas that get developed in the 
in the uh, academic world. So most of you uh, have heard of this, uh, but you've all heard of the Amy Dice of the American Medical Informatics Association, which uh, took seriously the confusion about just what the name of the field should be, how it should be defined, what the core competencies were that people had to have if they were going to call themselves well trained in the field. And about six years ago, came out with this paper in Jamia uh, that basically defined the core competencies and also tried to come up with a very explicit definition of the field. And I'm not going to go through it in detail, but I just want to remind you that this definition, which came out from literally every word in there, got changed during the process of the, of the group think that went on to create that paper. Okay. Uh, so every word was selected with great care. But the word computer and communications and technology is not in that definition, right? And that's very intentional. There's a whole bunch of corollaries that are provided in the paper if you look at it. But fundamentally, the science here is really this. And that's what we're trying to produce expertise in in master's and PhD programs in this field and our fellowship programs now. And I had to convince people that the field didn't already exist and couldn't be done say, in the computer science department. And as soon as you start drawing pictures like this that show the things you need to have been exposed to to be well trained in biomedical informatics, people said, well, yeah, you wouldn't get all that in a computer science program, or you wouldn't get all that in basically any other program. And you don't get all of every one of those boxes in an informatics program. We don't teach compiler theory in, computer, in, in informatics programs. You might get it in a, in a computer science degree, but you don't need it in an informatics program. Or if you really need it because you're doing something unusual, you can always add it. But it's certainly not a requirement. The computer science stuff you do need to know are things like this. You know, AI, language processing, machine learning, doing computer interaction, databases. I say et cetera because everybody will have another favorite thing. And there are others that you could add. Okay. But these are obviously core notions that are really important in informatics and explain why there's often confusion about the relationship between informatics and computer science. But look at all the other boxes. Those are not all computer science boxes. So the decision sciences, cognition, management science for people that are going in that direction, understanding clinical medicine and the basic biomedical sciences at some level. Bioengineering, our main area of overlap with bioengineering is smart devices and, and imaging. There's a lot of, especially tissue stuff in bioengineering, a lot that's really quite different from what we do in mathematics. And statistics and data science, obviously, are the parts of what we need to be able to draw on. So that, 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 that article has a diagram, which I often draw on to just try to make some of these distinctions about science of informatics and the applied world of informatics. So the, the, the diagram is meant to show, if we go from a kind of basic research view of this field to a much more applied research view and, and, uh, and the actual practice of informatics, which is what the clinical informatics fellowships are about, the practice of informatics. And there's a spectrum from molecules and cells and tissues and organs on the left up to patients and individuals and populations and society on the right. Okay, so biomedical informatics as a discipline, such as is represented by this department, is about education and research. At the top of the diagram, a lot of basic stuff goes on in this department. This is where the new ideas get started that no company would probably do. If companies would do it, you have to ask what you're doing. So there are methods and techniques and theories, and on the clinical end of the spectrum, that patients, individuals, populations, and societies, we have a lot of applied areas that are often called health informatics. And they really are two big categories, clinical informatics and population health and public health informatics. So what's HIT? Well, uh, first let me say this one. Clinical informatics is now where I would lump Nursing informatics, dental informatics, medical informatics. Medical informatics is now being used pretty much just to refer to 
physicians and diseases rather than health promotion, etc. Uh, but this is the HIT point. The applied practice of health informatics is what is where we find HIT and BMI overlap. On the other side, we have bioinformatics and imaging informatics, and structural informatics. But wait, there's space here. There's space. So what goes in there? It's the stuff that spans it all, right? Translational science. So translational bioinformatics, TBI, clinical research informatics. Pretty hard to draw out. <coughs> firm boundaries between those two areas. They overlap a great deal. That's why they are joined in a single meeting that Amy puts on. This field at the top is now populated. I've spent a lot of my later years working on these kinds of activities. Textbook of bioinformatics that we referred to earlier and journal of bioinformatics that I edited. But there are lots of other good journals in the field. I like this quote from uh, Bill Tierney, who's now down in Texas. Clinical informatics is really the basic science of clinical medicine. It that way. It captures something. I won't debate it, but you get my point. All right. So when we were building in 1968 EHRs at Mass General Hospital, this is the image we had of why they were needed. Right. I want to be able to see a patient get the data about what I saw into a computer, and the next time I see that patient, I want to be able to look at treatment. And I'd like other doctors who are also seeing the same patient to do the same so that I can see what they put in as well. So it was very much oriented on the direct patient care model within an institution, which isn't surprising. In 1968, we didn't have great big health systems of the sort that we have today. But when the EHR efforts of 2009 got underway, this was not considered to be enough. This is not making total meaningful use of the EHR. That's all you do with it. So we had to define what meaningful use was, and George Ripsack is one of the chairs of the committee that helped to define it for uh, ONC and for the incentive program. Right? If you don't know a lot about any use, just type that phrase into Google and see how many documents you get back. You won't know where to start. So we, we point out that electronic health records are filled with other things besides what doctors put in, right? Clinical data, data sources. G's and EG's and the like. And if only all that were available for biomedical and clinical research. And if we pooled our clinical data within our whole hospital system or with our related providers, so patient data flowed fluidly. Uh, and we could also ask questions, analytical questions, about patients in their entire experience, not just within a single institution. So we have this notion that they need to also feed into regional and national public health and disease registries. That's how we are getting all of that. And it's from those kinds of activities that we develop new knowledge, new standards for preventing disease or uh, treating it, diagnosing it. That leads to us creating new protocols and guidelines and educational materials as our knowledge evolves. We want to deliver that back as it starts to get hairy and voluminous uh, in the form of decision support, order entry systems, and then we make that available back to the clinician. If we do that, we've got this cycle where the clinician is actually creating data which ultimately come back and benefit the clinician. And this is what has been called a learning healthcare system in recent years. It's a, hot topic, everybody's trying to say we ought to be learning much more from what we do than we've traditionally done in the, before the era of the EHR. And many of the subsequent meaningful use in phase two and three requirements, I mean, this has all gone through a huge amount of evolution, but 
they were designed to try to get us more into this full cycle that I'm describing here. The learning healthcare system has become a subject of a lot of attention and study itself. Here's a report from the Institute of Medicine on the subject. Uh, came out in 2011, but it's still written out as a new journal called Learning Healthcare Systems, Direct Treatment Edits. I, I'm gonna, I don't think I have time to go through this, so let me just, just skip over these two. I do want to comment on how most of us in medicine remember the kind of parallel use of two, two words that seem to mean the same thing about 10 years ago, personalized medicine and individualized medicine. Some doctors said, I've always been giving personalized medicine, and it became clear that there was kind of a miscommunication about what was implied that the real emphasis here was on the, the use of types of information that used to have that were very patient-specific, mostly genetic, uh, in order to custom tailor what we do for patients. So this led to this thing called the Precision Medicine Initiative. Uh, I think you know that that started on Obama. <coughs> And he was smart enough to download this picture from the, from his website in the White House because you won't find that one anymore. <laughs> okay, but do you believe we actually have a president standing beside DNA molecules? <laughs> Those were the good old days. <laughs> well, the Precision Medicine Initiative didn't go away, but it's, it has been renamed under the new administration, right? Uh, and that's uh, the All of Us Research Program, which actually I think very much involves this department. A lot of people here are involved. Columbia is looking for people to join the million individuals who are going to be in the database. And if you go to NIH now, you'll find web pages that always refer to this as the All of Us Research Program, not as the Precision Medicine. So this, all this genetic information now becomes yet another thing that, that physicians order, and it goes in the data systems and ends up in the EHR, and it's supposed to be available to us as providers. And we can ask the question, what do we as providers know about how to use that information in general? It creates new problems for the informatics community. Here's a paper from 2012, just trying to figure out how should we store genetic information in the EHR? How much of it? And if someone's got an, uh, an unusual tumor, should we be storing more than one full genome? The one for the, for the tumor cells and the one for the normal cells of the individual, for example. Lots of thorny questions. And this was a report on a workshop that studied just that issue. But our learning healthcare system is evolving too because suddenly we've got new kinds of data in this world and we want to use those data as well. So we have to add to all the stuff that I had in this earlier version of the diagram, the big data from massive data sets like from the genome of individuals. Add to that big data from monitored behaviors of which the best example and it's well represented in this department by Nick Patinetti's work is uh, how can, what can you figure out by watching what people are doing using search engines? What do they Google? What two or three things do they Google at the same time that tells them something about what might be going on out there? They, they, they actually have a lovely article that, that they wrote that maybe you, you are familiar with that shows how you can actually find new drug-drug interactions by, by looking at large search data sets looking at social media, Facebook, Twitter, and the like, Fitbits, and the data sources that they provide. All this stuff you now is potentially part of this learning healthcare system too. This picture is designed to help you believe that the problem is not yet solved and there's still lots for people to find out with Max to do. This whole genetic phenomenon has opened up new issues involving privacy. Privacy is a big topic for us already, but now you add the genetics, 
and we have these concerns, not about what's currently true about the patient, but what might be true about them in the future, given their genetic makeup or their children. And the privacy leads to that. And uh, I think most people who practice medicine, you know, you're still at the bedside a lot, maybe using a tablet instead of a pen and paper. But uh, the genetic information on that patient suddenly becomes potentially important. Um, you need decision support to help you figure out such things as how to order the right tests in this world, how to interpret the results when they come back, and then how to consult the patient given the results that you Lots of new opportunities for research in that interface, it seems to me, as well. So I said I would talk about the translational science. I'm going to finish with that. The CTSA program really was a big turning point for our field, as well as the, uh, the stimulus bill. This all started back around 2006. Uh, you've all heard of the CTSAs. Columbia was one of the first to get one, so it's, it's one of the old timers in the area. Every medical, academic medical center and many others have tried to get CTSAs. Many of them have succeeded, but not quite a few. They were started by the head of NIH, who basically, uh, his legacy is the CTSA program. He uh, wrote this paper in Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics, laying out the rationale for it. Zerhuni himself was more of an uh, engineer than a typical NIH director has been, and he understood technology and basically defined the CTSAs as needing to have biomedical informatics cores. That's the phrase they used in the call for proposals. You must have core expertise in biomedical informatics. Well, that worked out well for Columbia because they got one of these early grants because they had core expertise in biomedical informatics. But you'd be surprised how many major institutions were writing proposals in which they said, well, we've got great desktop support and our network is really fast. And they thought that was, that's what biomedical informatics was. And so suddenly, when they found out they were not getting their grants, largely because of the informatics portion of their proposals, there was a huge interest in uh, learning what this was all about. And the best thing that happened for some of us who did a lot of consulting at that time in medical schools who were trying to think about starting programs, recruiting new talent and the like, was when a dean would say to you after you'd been there a day or two, I don't know if we're ever going to get a CTSA, but we really ought to be doing this. Okay. So it wasn't, once they understood what the field was and why it was important, many of them actually came around and said, this is something we need to do. So I mentioned that AMIA has its joint summits. It's actually uh, held as one meeting now. Uh, it happened that this year, both the uh, track chairs, uh, the major track chairs were from New York, Nick and, and uh, Joe Dipatak from uh, Cornell. But here's the case. Here's the case for why biomedical informatics need to be part of the CTSA program from from Zerhuni's perspective. Now, this is kind of the diagram behind the whole CTSA concept. <coughs> Understanding disease and this potential application of new discoveries, validating them through so-called translational T1 research, getting them out into the community, emphasizing these second phases of translational science, discovering in the community the new things that need to be understood and treated, and that cycle is meant to continue. And I like showing this picture and then asking people, so where does informatics fit into this picture? Everywhere. There's a role for informatics in every part of that picture. And that's what certainly you said in the call. So suddenly we've seen this explosion in numbers of departments, number of faculty positions. And it all dovetails with and, and interacts with the precision medicine program. And if you look at CDSA activities, there's so many data science and, and informatics related components like this one. The so called National Center for Data Health. Here's an activity in the private sector, it's a nonprofit. Uh, you'll notice the platform will be unveiled 
on July 19th. And this is all uh, being done by Idacin at UCSF and others. And the whole point of this effort is to uh, enhance data sharing among researchers. So I can close that. Loads of applications regarding informatics and clinical translational science. New methods that are needed for new informatics research. And what are the bottom line uh, our conclusions? One, a major constraint is we still don't have enough people, even though we're training a lot more than we used to. Um, but there's hope. There are a growing number of educational programs in bioinformatics. MS, PhD, fellowships for health professionals, growing number of training programs in applied health information technology for people that don't want to be researchers but want to have deep understanding of the field for applied, to work in applied settings and HIT. Essentially, everybody now has a CMIO in their organization. That didn't used to be the case. And many of the CMO, CMIOs are coming now from with informatics backgrounds. And of course, many of them are now getting certified through the uh, ABMS subspecialty in clinical informatics for physicians. Um, and are bringing that, that knowledge out in a more, much more practical way. I'm not sure Judy Faulkner likes seeing all those informatics trained CMIOs out there can complicate her life, uh, but they should, they, we should complicate her life because there's problems with her product, and she needs to hear from people in the technology that they assess and critique it. So, we go back to the picture. There are current limitations uh, to our systems. We know that, including EHRs and decision support systems, but the progress is clear. I mean, if you look in the grand scheme of things, so much has happened that's possible. And we need more informatics expertise, informed feedback back into the research community, um, and then much more interaction between the research community and those that are doing the implementation of these, these kinds of systems. So, boy, right on the nose of one hour. Sorry, I didn't leave a whole lot of time for questions, although I'd be happy to take any of the people who want to stay around. I have a question. Thank you so much. It was a great uh, retrospective and perspective. Something, I'm going to go back to something that I really like the analogy with the commercial uh, aviation. aviation. Yes, mm -hmm. and you ended it also on the point of volume. So one thing I wonder is um, when you look at the commercial uh, airplanes, what I think happened there is that there was a very clear, undeniable volume, right? So they were clunky, there were a lot of security issues, they were inconvenient, they were, um, there was a lot of turbulence, but all of a sudden you could get somewhere within a day that used to take weeks. What would that be? in clinical practice. I wonder if there is something in the current EHR systems where physicians or clinicians feel that, wow, I can suddenly do something that I couldn't before. And what would that be? Because I think that would. So we have, we have quite a bit of experience now with physicians that in fact, in no way want to go back. Okay. Uh, they may be crit critics of the problems with what they're using, but they can see tremendous advantages. Simple issues of access. I mean, I can remember seeing patients in an emergency room where you could not get their old paper chart. It had been locked by the orthopedist in their office for the weekend. You know, that's the kind of stuff that happened. You couldn't provide optimal care. You couldn't look up anything about it. And you had to go with their history, and if they're prostrate, you, 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 you know, you might as well be in a field hospital somewhere with some medicine. So I think most physicians do not actually want to back their They just wish these darn EHRs were back. And that's what most of the, most of the surveys show. There's this, if you haven't seen it, there's this wonderful piece. I shared it on the acne list. Maybe a few of you saw that. It, it, um, it was written by Faith Fitzgerald, who's this master clinician at UC, UC Davis. Uh, 
uh, and she, she tells a story about a patient who was from Iran who was really upset about the way that the Uriyat had been translated into English. Okay. And he was sick in the hospital, but she ended up building this relationship with him and learning a lot about him through the stories he told about, about the Uriyat, Omar Khayyam, and you know, all that stuff. And it was, to her, that's why she was in medicine. And then she has this almost secondary couple of paragraphs of packing the EHR at the end of this story, which was really about the importance of narrative medicine and the stories as they relate to patients. Uh, and about how you, there's just no way she could have recorded any of this anymore in the EHRs that she used. Uh, and I looked at them and I said, this is the kind of thing that we ought to be thinking about how to fix in the EHR. I can imagine ways you could try it capture the narrative more effectively in the EHR. There are opportunities for researchers to try that. We can put an MP3 in the EHR. So there are loads of ways you can think about trying to address it. I don't, I'm not pretending I have the solution, but the, the fact is a lot of the things they're complaining about, we could work on even if the companies won't. I can tell you, Judy Faulkner is not going to read that and say, I got to do something about narrative medicine. But we could, because these are the things that are keeping her product from being well accepted. And hers is probably better accepted than any of the others. So, I don't think there's any going back. Most people tell you that. So I want to go back. But please make them better. <laughs> are there any like, current examples of EHRs that are done right and focus on patient care and research. Like, I don't know if Kaiser has a different system or what factors I would <laughs> um, but yeah. is there, what are the challenges of really implementing that? Because you, you're saying there's hospitals are on as businesses. I don't and want to seem like a diet against, against Epic. I think that in fact Epic has worked well for Kaiser largely because they have an incredibly large and rather uniform healthcare system and therefore they really did do one implementation across all their sites, at least in California. I'm not sure if they've done the whole country, but at least the, the, the northern and southern, the southern California use one big system. So you really can get it anything from any of the places where the patients seem to have help you if they went to your local academic medical center for an ER visit. You, know, you won't be able to get that. So I think that there are, there are, one of the most impressive EHRs I ever saw being used was I had a, a shoulder injury. I went to see an orthopedist in Houston once when I was working over there. And this guy had absolutely optimized his EHR to make it totally just touching things. And he was done with his note in a minute and 30 seconds when, after he saw it. And I went out and he handed me a print out of it, all in text. And I realized. This guy only did shoulders. <laughs> he didn't need to encode hardly anything except for details about the shoulder and where the pain was and what drugs the guy was taking and what surgeries he had. I mean, all the other stuff that you need to have in the EHR was not part of it. So in very narrow areas, we can do really optimal kind of EHR is focused on a very specific use. Uh, but it's the, it's the generalized EHR that a large hospital like a, like a Columbia Medical Center did. Uh, or a New York Irving Medical Center. Is that what it's not? New York Irving Medical Center? No, Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Yeah, that's it. C-U-I-M-C. -I, I to keep up with the names. <laughs> uh, so I think there are specialized EHRs for very specific practice settings that we also do. But it's this generalized solution that's a problem. Yeah. I guess kind of dovetailing that, is there any um, movement or push to regulate how these EHRs communicate so that if you have you know, different practices have different EHRs, you really like make them central essentially so that they can communicate? So yes, I mean that is now what the major ONC pressure is on is this, this uh, uh, search for 
true interoperability. Um, I mean, I think you've heard stories about two different Epic installs in, in the same city you can't either exchange data because of different decisions made by the institutions and, and, and the lack of, therefore, being able to, to translate data from one setting to the other. So these kinds of stories, I didn't mean for this to, to turn into a big Epic discussion. <laughs> Because uh, I, I don't think Epic is worse than anybody else. In fact, I think they're probably better than most. Maybe that's why they deserve a little bit more uh, skewers. So they'll take some of this more seriously. But uh, interoperability has been, we've been talking about it for 25 years at least, 30 years. It's not a new problem. Yet. Um, and it all has to do with standards, acceptance in the community. Um, uh, and will. And really, one of the main reasons that there were people in the 90s calling for an ONC type organization was frustration in the way in which standards work was, uh, was being done through HL7 and other organizations, which, despite all the best of intentions, wasn't managing to get real traction in the industry in ways that was allowing true interoperability to really occur. I mean, we had a conversation yesterday with George about trying to get everybody to use Arden. You know, we are in syntax for rules, which Epic in their wisdom decided not to use. He thought Cerner did, but I don't know. Okay. So Ted, it's worth noting that the Meaningful Use Program is going to be renamed Promoting yes. Interoperability. Yeah, they're not even going to call it Meaningful Use anymore. That's right. right. That's true. Interoperability is the new, uh, I don't know, optimal goal, the top goal. But, it hasn't been real 